All right, uh, before we bring our next speaker out here, uh, I have some stuff I want to get off my chest. Um, I have, for the last uh, five, six years, been obsessing over a specific problem that I think is going to transform uh, what it looks like for the next 10 years of humanity. So uh, at some point, the slides will come up and keep me company, but I'll get started and tell you about it. Um, so I think that in the next 10 years, uh, we are going to have a fundamentally different way that we run every aspect of our lives. And um, I think that this technology is going to be so prevalent, it's going to be the, the basic way that every one of us administers what we do. Uh, I think we're going to have a timeline from which every aspect of our lives is managed. And that timeline will change how we live, how we love, how we work, how we play. It'll change every aspect of who we are. And the time before that timeline starts will look like a black hole. It'll be unknowable. unknowable. And we'll have this moment, this like year zero, from which our timeline begins. And I think this is believable because every 10 years or so, something comes from industry or from the military and finds its way into the public consciousness. So if you consider, for example, client-server computing, that gave us the home PC. If you consider the wide area network and DARPA, that gave us consumer internet. If you consider pagers and cell phones, that's the smartphone in your pocket. And I think that this year zero timeline, this sort of life timeline that we govern ourselves with, is how big data finds its way into the public consciousness, into the consumer market. It's also how enterprise resource planning finds its way there. Catherine Barr calls this life resource planning, this idea that we can administer every aspect of our lives using this technology. And this isn't just fitness nuts logging every step they take, or financial tools helping us to analyze our spend, or medical accessories looking at our vital signs, or group calendaring and messaging that's helping us to plan our days and our lives with others. Or rather, it's all of these things and a lot more. But we're not looking at it at the big picture yet. We're still looking at the elephant with apologies to the Hadoop world, and we're grabbing its leg and saying it's a tree, or we're grabbing its tail and saying it's a snake. The whole thing is much bigger than these pieces parts we're building. And before you say 10 years is too short, consider two things. First, we didn't have smartphones 10 years ago for all intents and purposes. And today there are prosthetic brains. We can't remember how to get places. We forget people's phone numbers. But secondly, and vastly more importantly, we're already there. I mean, you all have speeding tickets. Uh, you have tax uh, history, income tax history. You have vaccination records. Well, in San Francisco, maybe many of you have vaccination records. Um, we have cell phone tower logs that show where we've been traveling. You have credit scores. You have ATM withdrawals. You have airplane traffic. The problem is that while this data exists, in most cases, you don't have access to it. So here's a second prediction. I think that a defining moral issue of the next decade will be that nobody should know more about your life than you do. Bringing this life feed, this year zero tool to market is a trillion dollar problem. There are only a few companies poised to solve that problem today with the wherewithal and the infrastructure and the knowledge about you. And these companies are already engaged in a huge land grab for your time and interest. Jeremy Silver calls content a gateway drug. And if you layer on top of that social graphs and peer pressure and context, it makes it really hard to leave. So you're essentially being lured inside a walled garden where your life feed will exist. And changing that walled garden to another garden will be incredibly difficult. This life feed will have very wide-ranging implications. For example, gone is the expectation of innocence. The absence of an alibi is enough to throw suspicion on something. Thoughtfulness means far less. I mean, people used to do nice, thoughtful things for one another. How many people here are impressed that someone remembers their birthday now that we have Facebook? So if someone's thoughtful, maybe they just have better software than you. Time, it's time for the personal agents to arrive. We've already seen Google Now and Cortana and Siri move from the idea of responsive uh, search to anticipatory search, interrupting us wisely when they've got something important to tell us. And this will widen the digital divide. Those of us who can afford agents will thrive, often at the expense of those who don't. But tomorrow's agents will go much, much further than this, plucked straight from science fiction, like the young lady's illustrated primer in the Diamond Age. And we have to ask ourselves questions like, does our digital agent have the right to plead the fifth? Is it entitled to attorney-client privilege? We don't have legislation for this yet. And I believe this life feed is going to shape the future of consumer technology in ways we can't properly conceive. Just like um, the PC or the smartphone or the consumer internet, this is a trillion-dollar industry, it's a massive business opportunity, but it's more than just a new market or a new industry. This is the start of a new species. And while that might seem like an overstatement, 
this year zero tool is really the top of a slippery slope towards the singularity. And um, the reality is that when the machines get intelligent, we may not even notice because we'll be us and they'll be them. So maybe it's a little early for those kinds of thoughts, but this is what's been keeping me awake at night for the last couple of years.